Welcome to all of you, my great team, Syria Relief family. So we are very privileged today to have with us Dr. Hani Banna. Dr. Hani Banna is the founder of Islamic Relief, chairman of Muslim Charities Forum and the Humanitarian Forum. So he is real humanitarian. Uh, I have been working with Dr. Hani in different platforms and we always consider him as our mentor, our teacher in the humanitarian sector. So today, we here in Sierra Relief, we are very privileged to have him with us to learn from his experience, to gain from his wisdom. As you know, wisdom is a key these days. So please listen carefully and feel free to ask any question. Dr. Hen. Alhamdulillah wa sallam wa rasulullah. Thank you very much for giving me the, the opportunity to be with you today because it's an honor for me to visit you and to learn from your 10 years experience. 10 years, isn't it? 10 years. And you are a good sign of the response to a special catastrophe, which is a global catastrophe affecting one area. But the number of people suffering from such an area is incredible. It's compared second to the Second World War. The number of displacement, the number of dead, the number of injured, the number of cities destroyed, the kind of destruction affecting the different cities and different uh, villages and different towns and the people on the move. Over the last few weeks, more than 900,000 people went out from one zone only. If you compare the number of the Syrians who have been affected by the conflict, which is more than 14 million or 15 million people inside Syria and outside Syria, apart from the nearly 1 million people who are dead and died or killed by the conflicting uh, parties, you can imagine that this more than nearly 50% of the, of the nation of Syria. For me, if I talk about Syria, it's very sentimental for me because we started working for Syria since April, May 2011 when we were trying to put some pressure on the United Nations and on the League of Arab States in Cairo to do something about Syria. And I remember one of my meetings was actually in July uh, with the Undersecretary for Social Affairs of the uh, League of Arab States. And this was in July. And she said they did not have political decision to make any uh, platform, any, 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 any conference or any workshop for Syrian refugees. By December 2011, we managed to do the first ever conference, humanitarian conference for Syria with the UNOCHA and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in Cairo, 17 December 19, uh, 2011. This is our role to be engaged with a catastrophe which could not be able to measure the scale of its destruction, of its destruction and the, 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 the unbelievable silence of, especially over the last few weeks, of what's happening in Idlib and different parts of the country. I look at Syria as a scar not on the face only of one zone or one nation or one culture or one faith, but it's an ugly scar and ugly crime against humanity. And under terrorism, they can put anything. They can put anything to destroy your country, to destroy your nation, to displace your nation, to destroy your society, to destroy your community, and, 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 and. Terrorism has no definition. 
agreed upon by every country. In spite of the fact more than 170, 180 countries signed up for fighting terrorism. But what's terrorism? Just let me to understand what's terrorism. Is terrorism is something when I defend my family at home, is I am a terrorist? When I defend my shop, I am a terrorist? When I defend my site, I am a terrorist? When I defend my country, I am a terrorist? Tell me what terrorist means. But unfortunately for, for humanity, the Syrian children and the Syrian mothers and the Syrian fathers and the Syrian nation are the only sufferer, while most of the people actually, not all, most of the people are actually keeping silent to what's happening there. I'm very fortunate to be with you today because you are responding to what's happening of calamities to the children of Syria, which I cannot imagine that at this weather, when I'm wearing my coat, when I'm wearing an overcoat, when I have a central heating here, and I'm still feeling cold, and they have no shoes, they have no food, they have no blankets, they have no clothes sometimes, they have no dwelling apart from a tent or no tent in the middle of the snow. And this put an immense sense of responsibility in each and every one of us. Can you imagine that we are here in our houses in Manchester, as I am visiting you in Manchester, and you don't have central heating in the middle of January or end of December? Will you be able to sustain your life, Brother Steve? No, of course not. And you are in a house. You are not on the road. But the only thing that you have, you don't have gas heating, you don't have central heating, you don't have any sort of heating. People die, even here in the UK, the elderly people die because of the electricity during the winter seasons. This is a problem happening to all the children. A victims of rape happening there to those young girls and young women who have been in jail and prison for no reason. No reason, unfortunately. So the immense responsibility on you give me the feeling that you have been chosen by Allah to respond, to sustain the operation, to decrease and remove the agony from the hearts and body and the mind of those children. We don't know what will happen to them when the war ends soon, and I hope to soon and not later. We'll have these psycho, psychosocial problems where they become themselves radicals, will become themselves extremists, will become themselves terrorists because they have seen their parents being killed, their house being blown up and destroyed, and their relatives are being killed as well or displaced. Families that you find some part of the family in Turkey, some part could be in, in Jordan, some part in Lebanon, some part in Europe. There's no family anymore. There's no community anymore. There's no society anymore. There's no country anymore, unfortunately. And this is where we, as Syria Relief messengers and people who have the mission, who have to stand up for the agony and who have to stand up for what the people need from us. Whether it's advocacy, whether it's communication, whether it's networking, whether it's fundraising, whether it's implementation of relief response or development, anything. We cannot just be sitting down doing nothing. Because we represent the people who have nothing to do. And the people who have nothing actually cannot be supported by the people who do nothing. So we have to do something actually to stop those people and to save these people's lives, credibility and the integrity. And I think each and every one of us each and every one of us will be asked by the Creator, have you seen it? Yes. What have you done? Could you have been doing something more? Yes. Why didn't you? Very simple, stupid questions by children who say, where are the people who are going to help me? Where are the people who see me on the television and listen to me on the television? or on the Facebook, or on the Twitter, or whatever it is, and do nothing. What wrong have I done as a young boy or a young girl at the age of seven or eight or nine or ten, 
or four or five. Why you kill me? Why you kill my mother? Why you kill my father? Why you kill my sister? Why you destroy our, our city? Why you destroy our, our, our houses? Why you make me displaced and refugee? Why? What, what wrong have I done? This is the question. If we are humanitarian worker here, and we claim it right that we are humanitarian worker, we have to stand up, to stand up for this simple question. From such a young boy or a young girl or a victim of rape, many children, many women, and maybe men even in certain areas, maybe young men as well, have been raped, become victim of rape in this uh, area of the world. So today is not just trying to uh, fundraising, fundraise for Syria. Today we have to be raising the awareness of the people on the globe of what's happening in different parts. Syria is one of them, but it could be some different parts in the world like Central African Republic, like the Democratic Republic of Congo, like Libya, like uh, Yogor in China, like Yemen, like Palestine, like all this. It's your responsibility, Steve, to do that. And our Charles Dickens brother is supposed to do that. You have written a lot of stories before and made a lot of movies. And now is the right time to start standing up for those people. Really, really, it's, I, I'm, I'm envying you because I'm not anymore a relief worker. But I am one of your helper who will be able to put my hand in your hand and we'll go together to try to do something. Even if we fail, it does not make any difference. If we fail, it doesn't make any difference. Just keep trying. Keep trying, keep trying. Even if we fail at our generation, the generation will come, will find that their fathers and their mothers and their uncles and their aunties managed to do something, but they failed. So they can start with dignity and we can raise the least. We can motivate the youngsters and raise their morale try to do something for the people there. So today, I am very honored to be with you. And alhamdulillah, I see that all of you young are young, but I am younger than all of you and each one of you. In spite of the fact you are bald like my baldness, look at your hair, come with me. We have, we have to have a selfie together of the baldness. The baldness means frankness, means trust, means respect. <laughs> Uh, Which is more bold? Me, probably. Which is more shining? Me. You can answer. <laughs> Look at his I head and my head. I think it's me. <laughs> he has more. Tra I'm a, I have more traffic. <laughs> you are more shining. He's more shining. No, you are. More shining. No, no, he is. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot see it. <laughs> but anyway, I think uh, it's an honor and uh, it's an honor and an honor and honor for me to see young people. Can I look? Bismillah, mashallah. Bismillah, mashallah, bismillah, mashallah. All those young people, and it gave me a sign of encouragement. Because when we started this work nearly 40 years ago, we were as young as you were, you are, or maybe younger or maybe older. But to manage to keep our spirit, you know why? Because those young children are the motivators who kept our spirit high to be with you after nearly 37 years of continuous work on the road. Being a street worker, not an office worker. Being a field worker, not only an office worker. We need the office work, but we need to go to the street, then we need to go to the field. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani, for what? The wisdom. Ah, oh, I don't know if it's wisdom. Shining everywhere. Can you see it there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Give me two kilos. <laughs> uh, as Dr. Hani said, we are, I think, privileged to serve the people of Syria. And I like always to use the term Dr. Hani uses, which is those who pay our salaries. So your salaries doesn't come from trustees or from CEO. Really, 
the salaries come from the beneficiaries, the people we serve. The providers. The providers. So we should always think about what can we do to support the providers. So the catastrophe is really huge. And what we are doing still is small. Although I believe you guys are doing a fantastic job. I'm doing that. And in fundraising, in advocacy, in marketing, in programs, in many, many areas. Yes, this is a small team, but this small team has a lot of baraka and doing excellent job. So I think I'm very proud to have this team here around me working together to support our brothers and sisters in Syria. So keep going. We still have a lot to do and support. You've seen just the last 24 hours our brothers and sisters the Syrians in, in Lebanon, you have seen them in the TV, in social media. The temperature was minus 10, snowing everywhere, and very, very difficult situation. If you add to that, to the situation of our brothers and sisters inside Syria, the displaced, as Dr. Hani said, just in the last few weeks, the number reached 900,000, the biggest since the start of the crisis. So we have big responsibility and we will continue together sure. doing as much as we can to support those who are in need. So let us continue the journey and the mission and everyone try his or her best. Just give you final point, as you know, we published something in the news this early morning, it was published. Charles came to the office 6 a.m. His work not to come to the office 6 a.m. He done his job with the media, he put things there, the message. But while he was doing that, we had discussion last night, he said, maybe someone early morning will read the article and will call to give donation. So we didn't ask any of you. He volunteered. He came 6 in the morning. He received some donation. So just before we arrived to the office, Charles sent me a message saying 600 pounds were raised in the morning before any of us reached the office. So please put your hands together for Charles. Come on, Charles. Come on. Charles. We'll and his team. We'll give, we'll give the plaque. <laughs> Where's the plaque? Give me the cup. You have a chance if you want oh, to say a word. Oh, great. This was. <laughs> That's the plug. What, what? You can take it, please. <laughs> was, okay, thank yeah. you very much. Can you take this, it from him, please? This Come wonderful plug is no, quite heavy. Go. Here we go, mate. <laughs> of my plug. It's for my team. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, you, you know me from being sat in the corner every day. I think I saw you before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're all doing a really good job. And I think you're all valuable members of the team, and I love working with every single one of you. Thank you so much for your support and your help. Thank you. Thank you. So again, if you have any question, <clears throat> please feel free to ask uh, Dr. Hani. Any question? Jessica? Stephen? <clears throat> Sonia? No questions? Dr. Hani, do you want to comment? Just last comment after okay. what you I, heard about. I, I comment on what I have commented <coughs> on before. I don't know what that else to say. I think the more you give, the more you take back. If you are a farmer, I've got a very fertile, fruitful land, and you don't look after it very pro properly, very well, it will never become fruitful. But if you are a farmer, and you go to the middle of the desert, you can change the desert, the desert into oasis, and you can make the desert green. The fruit only comes back to the people who work hard to plant the seeds and be patient to wait for the seeds to come. When we started nearly 37 years ago, it was 20 pence 
the beginning of the story. The 20 pence went and went and went and went and become hundreds of millions of pounds every year. Every year, not every year. With it, the 20 pence, one seed, one seed of, of wheat will produce in one, what do you call it? El Fasq, what that? Sumbula, Sumbula. What the meaning of Sumbula in English? Sumbula in English? In the Sumbula, you can go to look at the Sumbula, <laughs> 700 seeds. This is one, one blessing, one good act from you will be multiplied by Allah 700 times that he said, Wallahu yudha'afu al And Allah will multiply more to whom he likes. The multiplication doesn't only come to the Muslims. Come to the non-Muslims as well, like the Charles and you and everyone. It is your blessing in this life and the life to come. Because Allah will never discriminate in this life the reward that you can get. It's entirely up to you actually to give more reward for yourself, for your family, for your community. If you keep giving, you take back what you give. If you keep learning and educate yourself, you become a teacher, then you become a professor, then you become somebody who can direct your humanity because of what you have got or you have gained from being taught. Thank you. Jazakum Allah khair. May Allah bless you and I love you. I love, love you one. You I love you too. We all of you love you as well.